tuning in, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. Have you ever heard of the Roman Emperor Constantine? He had a massive impact on Christianity. Not only did he end the brutal persecutions of his predecessors, but he also used the Roman government to actively support the church. However, his involvement also resulted in significant changes that eventually led to the merger between church and state called Christendom. In this episode, you'll learn about the good and the bad effects of Constantine's involvement in Christianity. Here now is episode 493, part 11 of our early church history class, The Constantinian Shift. Today we're looking at one of the most influential people in church history, Constantine. He lived from the year 272 to 337. He's also called Constantine the Great, and he's also called Constantine the First because there were 10 more emperors named Constantine after him over the next thousand years. And the last emperor of the Byzantine, what we call the Byzantine Empire, they would have called it the Roman Empire, was Constantine the 11th. And uh, he was the last Roman emperor. He died when the Muslims took Constantinople in 1453. So this guy has a bit of a legacy, Constantine the First. In studying his life and looking at everything that he did, I've come across some Christian authors that are very much like in the cheerleading squad of Constantine, and they think he's just the best ever. I've come across a lot of critics as well that think he's the worst ever. And I hope what I can communicate to you is that he's both good and bad for Christianity. And uh, I think that's pretty much what you see with historical people in general. They always have a flaw. The only historical person I've ever studied without a flaw is Jesus. Everyone else has got this weird dark side or this aspect that is a little embarrassing. And Constantine has all kinds of that. So the traditional Christian view of the state, easily expressed by Paul in Romans 13, is that we're to be subject to governing authorities. They are God's servant for your good. Pay to all what is owed, taxes, revenue, respect, and honor. Peter likewise says in 1 Peter 2, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be of the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil. Peter even mentions the emperor specifically as someone to whom we need to be in subjection. Polycarp put it this way, We have been taught to pay proper respect to rulers and authorities appointed by God as long as it does us no harm. And that is certainly the case, that with Christians in the second half of the first century, throughout the second century, and in the third century, what we've seen in church history is that Christians really go out of their way to obey the law, but also there's a line where they won't go past, and that is when it infringes upon the commands of Christ, or it requires them to make sacrifice to the gods, which is idolatry, or if it requires them to say of Caesar something that they believe only belongs to Jesus, namely that Caesar is Lord. And so we have a lot of friction between Christians and the Roman Empire because of these limitations Although, by and large, Christians were great citizens. You know, we weren't causing riots and revolutions. You know, we were just trying to pay our taxes and show honor and not sacrifice to the gods and stay out of trouble. So then we had the great persecution. We looked at that last time. That was from 303 to 313 when Diocletian really tried to just liquidate the church, essentially. I mean, just incredible persecution of Christians during that time. Very torturous And then suddenly it stopped in the year 313 with the Edict of Milan. And this was actually, technically it's not an edict and it didn't happen at Milan, but never mind that. It's a letter sent by the two emperors, they were co-emperors at this time in the west and in the east, Constantine and Licinius. And together they announced toleration to Christianity in the year 313. And I want to show you in their own words what they said. 
I think this is a phenomenal statement, by the way. It says, When I, Constantine Augustus, and I also, Licinius Augustus, had met together under happy circumstances at Milan, we believed that we should give both to Christians and to all men the freedom to follow religion, whichever one each one chose, so that whatever sort of divinity there is in heavenly regions may be gracious and propitious to us and to all who live under our government. What a wonderful statement. After being persecuted for 10 years for the church to hear of this news, of this edict, that we are now tolerated, and so is everyone else, also in this edict was a proclamation that property should be restored to Christians that had been confiscated or stolen. Specifically, churches had to be given back to the Christians. So Constantine started favoring Christianity. And this was a really unusual experience for these Christians, some of whom have one eye because of the persecution. Some of them walk with a limp because they cut their hamstring on one leg. So they walk with a limp the rest of their lives. Many of everyone's lost somebody. And suddenly the government that's been torturing, persecuting, burning your Bibles, and murdering you says... We want to give you toleration. We want to give you peace. How much would you rejoice after so long a time of persecution? So Constantine starts favoring Christianity, and he exempts professional Christians like uh, bishops and so on from public office. He gives them tax exemption. That's where tax exemption for Christian pastors started, with Constantine. He allowed the use of the cursus publicus, which is the mail system for church business now. Also, for Christian leaders to travel using the horses that are maintained by the Roman Empire and the Cursus Publicus. Diocletian had ordered the scriptures to be burnt. Constantine commissioned new manuscripts to be copied of the Christian Bible, of the New Testament, but also with the Old Testament in Greek, some of which we have today, have actually survived from that time all the way to our day. Two very famous ones in particular. Instead of a scribe copying in the back room by candlelight, fearful that he's going to get arrested. Now we have professionally trained scribes that are going to copy manuscripts on parchment instead of papyrus. Parchment lasts a long time. It's made from animal skin. And they're encrusted with gems, these Bibles. I mean, we're talking about serious state sponsorship of Scripture. Constantine also closed all the law courts on Sunday. Isn't that interesting? And he forbade the branding on the face as a punishment because people are made in the image of God, and so you shouldn't mar their face as punishment. Constantine also contributed a lot to churches. At one point, he donated 3,000 folis. And from what I can tell, a folis is a bag of money. Nobody knows how much that is. But still, 3,000 bags of money, however big a <laughs> bag it was, These would be coins, coin money at that time. Donated to the churches in the African provinces. He rebuilt and enlarged, destroyed and damaged churches. And he built new churches, according to Eusebius, on a magnificent scale at the expense of the imperial treasury. So, you know how like young athletes are always looking for a sponsor? Somebody that can sponsor them and then they can get paid to do their thing. Christianity just got a sponsor, and guess what? It's the entire Roman government because the government is really controlled by the emperor and he is on on the team to some degree at least. Now we get architecture evangelism, something unheard of before this, where a pagan person could be walking through a street and see a massive Christian cathedral and say, what a gorgeous building. I wonder what happens in there. And they wander in and they would attend services to find out what's going on. Also, his mother, Constantine's mother, whom I suspect is the source of Constantine's, at least some of his positivity towards Christianity, uh, Flavia Julia Helena, uh, or as I just call her, Helena, uh, she did a lot for Christian churches in particular. She traveled to Jerusalem and to Bethlehem, and she had the temple that was built uh, over there destroyed, the pagan temple, to Venus. And 
She allegedly found a cave inside of which was a tomb and it had three crosses in it. So the story goes. And she wasn't sure which one of these is the true cross of Christ. So she took one of the crosses to an old lady nearby that was very sick, near to death, to see if it would heal her. And it didn't. So then she took the second cross and it didn't heal her. So she took the third cross and she was healed. So it must be the true cross of Christ. We have definitive proof. She sends part of it home to Constantinople, which they turn into a pillar uh, in the middle of the city. And uh, the other part she leaves behind and they build a church, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Still stands today. I've been there. You can go very close to this spot and and look at the very spot they think he was crucified. A lot of this is questioned by scholars today, whether that's really this site or not. But regardless, what does this tell you about Helena? It tells you that she has a real heart to locate sacred spots. We, we We actually get the language of relic used of the cross. And this has a whole history in the Middle Ages. And she even takes the the nails that she finds and sends them to her son, Constantine, who's the emperor. And according to Socrates, the historian, Constantine took and had made into bridle bits and a helmet, which he used in his military expeditions. Just think of the irony of that for a moment. I mean, I I seriously doubt that these are the actual nails that were used on Jesus, just for the record. But let's say they were. You're going to take the nails that the Roman Empire used to crucify Jesus and make it into military equipment for the Roman Empire to go attack other people. It's just, it's kind of like missing the point here. Helena also built a church over a cave in Bethlehem called the Church of the Nativity, and she built another church on the Mount of Olives. Constantine's government favored Christians in huge ways. Previously, as I mentioned, Christians avoided the government and government officials because they were persecuted. Now, Constantine actively searched out for Christians from everywhere to visit him at court. He wanted to become familiar with the lay of the land. He wanted to have bishops from different areas visiting him and advising him. Eusebius, who sounds a bit like a fanboy, and he was actually there during the time. So this is an eyewitness. He says, quote, he thought them worthy to share his home and table, end quote. So Eusebius is like, Can you believe it? The emperor is having Christians sit with him and eat meals. Constantine also appointed high-level positions to Christians. And now, for the first time, it's desirable to be a Christian for somebody that's looking for advancement in their career. Constantine had bishops accompany his soldiers so as to guarantee God's blessings. Christians started joining the military. And I think this is probably the clearest example of the Constantinian shift. Now, when I say the phrase Constantinian shift, I mean everything that changed from the way it was before Constantine to the way it was after Constantine. So there's lots of good stuff in there, and I would argue lots of bad stuff in there, too. It's not, it's not all one or the other. Let me just show you this about the Christian attitude towards the military. Of course, Jesus and his apostles taught to love their enemies. But I want to show you from the primary sources themselves what early Christians were saying about violence in general and and the military in particular before this. And I'm going to go really fast, but I'm just trying to get across the point that this was a dominant view that changed. The Didache, about the year 100, says, what these maxims teach is this, bless those who curse you and pray for your enemies Moreover, fast for those who persecute you. For what credit is it to you if you love those who love you? Is that not the way the heathen act? But you must love those who hate you, and then you will make no enemies. Justin Martyr writes, We who formerly used to murder one another do not only now refrain from making war upon our enemies, and he goes on from there. Irenaeus, about the year 180, writes, From the Lord's advent, that's the coming, the original coming of Christ, the new covenant that brings back peace, these Christians did form the swords and war lances into plowshares and change them into pruning hooks for reaping the corn, that is, into instruments used for peaceful purposes and that they are now unaccustomed to fighting, but when smitten, offer also the other cheek. Tertullian, about the year 200, 
But now inquiry is made about this point, whether a believer may turn himself unto military service and whether the military may be admitted unto the faith. Even the rank and file, or each inferior grade, to whom there is no necessity for taking part in sacrifices or capital punishments, there is no agreement between the divine and the human sacrament, the standard of Christ and the standard of the devil, the camp of light and the camp of darkness. One soul cannot be due to two masters, God and Caesar. But how will a Christian man war? Nay, how will he serve even in peace without a sword, which the Lord has taken away? For albeit soldiers had come unto John and had received the formula of their rule, albeit likewise a centurion had believed, still the Lord afterward, in disarming Peter, disarmed every soldier. Uh, Hippolytus writes in the year 215, A soldier of the civil authority must be taught not to kill men and to refuse to do so if he is commanded, and to refuse to take an oath. If he is unwilling to comply, he must be rejected for baptism. A military commander or civic magistrate who wears the purple must resign or be rejected. If an applicant or a believer seeks to become a soldier, he must be rejected, for he has despised God. Origen, in the year 248, wrote, We cut down our hostile and insolent swords into plowshares, and to convert into pruning hooks the spears formerly employed in war. For we no longer take up sword against nation, nor do we learn war any more, having become children of peace for the sake of Jesus, who is our leader. Cyprian, in the year 250, Neither is the sanctified body and temple of God polluted by adultery, nor, after the Eucharist carried in it, is the hand spotted with the sword and blood. Arnobius, in 305, writes, We should rather shed our own blood than stain our hands and our conscience with that of another. Lactantius, who was the tutor to Constantine, writes, It is not right that a worshiper of God should be injured by another worshiper of God. And in conclusion, Preston Sprinkle, who wrote a whole book that uh, talks about this topic in general called Fight, he says, Despite the presence of Christians in the military, it is clear that no single Christian writer before Constantine sanctioned the use of violence, not even toward bad guys, uh, which I, I thought was a pretty effective way of saying it. So you do have incidents where Christians are in the military starting in the third century, but that doesn't mean that they were fighting in the military or that they're being obedient to what their leaders are teaching them. And you do have a lot of people that write on this, and and Sprinkle's point is that they all agree on on the same thing. So what happened that that even bishops would go and participate in warfare and essentially bless Constantine's battles? Well, it's interesting that we have a coin that pictures Constantine with Sol Invictus. Now, this is the sun god. Constantine was a pagan. He was a pagan monotheist. And if you want to learn more about his beliefs and his religion, you should read Keegan Chandler's book called Constantine and the Divine Mind. It gets all into it. But as a pagan monotheist, he believed there was one high god overall. There were lots of other gods too, but there's one high god overall, and that is the sun, S-U-N, Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun. And so his face and the Sol Invictus face are right next to each other on this coin, which shows you his perspective. He's not coming from a Christian home. He's coming from a pagan background. He is a successful military man. He won over and over and over again. He won so many times. And so many. I don't have time to get into it with you, all the battles of Constantine and all the people that he challenged and defeated in, in unusual ways. But I will simply say this. I think if I was Constantine, I would start thinking, man, I must have divine support. I mean, how can you win this many times? So he did. He, he thought he was the companion of Sol Invictus, this, this pagan deity that people believed in. Now, Constantine had attacked Maxentius, This was an emperor who was competing with Constantine. They were both claiming to be the emperor of the West. Then there was an emperor in the East, too. There's only supposed to be two emperors and two junior emperors at that time. And so you have two guys that are both claiming it in the West. So Constantine decides to do somewhat of an ostentatious maneuver and attack the capital city of Rome itself. 
And uh, this is a city that is very hard to conquer. Other people have tried. It's got big walls. It's got big provisions. And you're attacking the capital of the place you're trying to rule. You know, it's, it's an awkward move, uh, at least from a public relations point of view, right? So anyhow, Constantine attacks Maxentius right outside of Rome at the Milvian Bridge. Before that happens, he had a vision. Constantine had a vision. This is why I mentioned the Sol Invictus, because his vision, and this is all allegedly, it's really hard to say for sure what actually happened, but allegedly he saw a sign of some sort above the sun. So some people speculate that it maybe was a cross, Maybe it was some other sign. Nobody knows. Maybe he didn't see a sign at all. That night, he then says he had a dream in which Christ came to him and told him to put the Cairo, the first two letters of Christ's name, on the shields of his soldiers, and that in this sign, he will conquer. So we have three or four versions of this story, two from Eusebius. The first one from Eusebius doesn't mention any of this stuff, and that's early. And then the later one from Eusebius is very elaborate, <laughs> and it has all the, uh, the additions to it. And then you, we have one from Lactantius and one from a pagan author. So it's not really clear what actually happened. But the, the fact is, this is the story that's told later on. And we have an image of this on a coin of Constantine uh, on what's called a standard. A standard is a military staff that has a banner on it. And above that is the symbol of the first two letters of Christ's name. It looks like an X and a P. In modern Greek, we say he ro But it sounds like he ro so I'm just going to say chi not to confuse you, okay? Uh, and uh, so that's like how you would recognize Christ's name. And it's in the, on this coin, it's pretty interesting. The uh, standard of Christ is stabbing a serpent underneath and Constantine's head is on the other side of the coin. So this is this symbol right here, the Cairo symbol, is what's called a labarum. Labarum. And you can find it all over the period in the 4th century from Constantine onwards. And again, it looks like an X with a P on top of each other. This is on a sarcophagus of Domitilla in the mid-4th century. It is interesting, though, that when Constantine won this battle, he had an arch constructed. The Arch of Constantine still stands to this day. You could go there and see the Arch of Constantine. And on it, there's no labarum, there's no Christian iconography, there's nothing on the shields of the soldiers. So what's the deal with that? Why, why, if that's really how it happened, why is it not on the Arch of Constantine that was built shortly after this? So it could be that Constantine got a little creative after the fact, or maybe he was just shy because the Roman Senate was paying for the Arch of Constantine and they weren't Christians. Who knows? Uh, there's, a, there's more questions than answers when it comes to the vision of Constantine. Whatever it was, the next day he went, he attacked Maxentius at the Milvian Bridge and defeated his 40,000 troops, defeated 100,000 that were there, and Maxentius fell into the river, the Tiber River. Constantine had him fished out, decapitated, and put his head on a spike and walked throughout the city to show them that he had defeated Maxentius. Standard operating procedure for military victory in those days, but not at all a Christian thing to do. Over time, Christian militaries would carry large golden crosses. Constantine weaponizes the cross and he weaponizes the name of Christ so that after Constantine, there are Christian armies. Before Constantine, there are not Christian armies. There might be Christians in the army, probably people that became Christian and couldn't leave the army and still had to stay in or else they would be executed. Uh, but after that, we get, by the time of Charlemagne, who is, considers himself an emperor, we get the order that if Christian soldiers find any pagans... They should give them the opportunity to convert, and if not, they are to execute them for being pagans. So we, we go from pacifism to you know, seriously deformed f versions of violence that happen over the centuries. Eventually, this even leads to the Crusades. If you ever studied the Crusades, 
Uh, they carry these big crosses into battle, and they're shimmering in the, in the light, and they're killing Muslims and Jews in the name of Christ. And then finally, it really peaks with the Holocaust, where the emperor at that time, Adolf Hitler, so, not really emperor, but you know, he thought of himself as certainly somebody that was trying to take over the world, and he uh, sought the blessing of the German churches on the Nazi campaign. And they did. They did bless the Nazi soldiers and what they did. So all of this, af- uh, of course, Constantine is not thinking about any of the, <laughs> the subsequent history, but you, you can see how each stage led to the next stage, and so eventually horrible things happen in the name of Christ. To me, that's a shift. Now, Christian leaders also did it in there. They also started asking the emperor, starting with Constantine and then later on with subsequent emperors, to help them settle scores with other Christians. This was a new development as well. You would not go to a Roman emperor, the one before Constantine, Diocletian, and say to him, can you help us with this schism in our church? We have these heretics over here, the Valentinians or the Marcionites, and and we just need you to persecute them for us. Would you be so kind as to help us with that? You just wouldn't wouldn't make that move before Constantine. But during Constantine and afterwards, that starts happening. As disagreements in the church arose, both sides appealed to emperors and sought the favor of the emperors to at least delegitimate their enemies. And we, and we end up seeing this very early on, even with Constantine. He has an edict against the heretics. This is the primary source. I'll read it right to you. Victor Constantinus Maximus Augustus. Whew, good name. To the heretics. Understand now by this present statute, ye Novatians, Valentinians, Marcionites, Paulians, those are followers of Paul of Samosata, ye who are called Cataphrygians, Montanus, and all ye who devise and support heresies by means of your private assemblies, it goes on, ye haters and enemies of truth and life in league with destruction, for as much then as it is no longer possible to bear with your pernicious errors, we have directed accordingly that you be deprived of all the houses in which you are accustomed to hold your assemblies, not in public merely, but in any private house or place whatsoever. We have commanded all the houses of prayer which belong to heretics be made over without delay to the Catholic Church. Let this edict be made public. Now, as it turns out, the Paulians are people that believe, like I believe, with respect to Christ. So for if I was alive in the 4th century, I would be rejoicing to not have persecution anymore, but then also at the same time thinking, wait, so we can't worship? <laughs> because my church has to be given over to the lowercase c Catholic or universal church. Certainly problematic. So the persecuted church became the persecuting church. That's a shift. And that's, in my opinion, a bad shift. David Brousseau summarizes it like this. This is from his book, Will the Real Heretics Please Stand Up? He writes, Only a few decades previously it had been a crime to be a Christian. Now it was a crime to be a heretic. The church silently accepted this development without protest. How much easier it was to use the authority of the state to silence heretics instead of having to argue with them. But soon, large segments of the church were labeling each other as heretics and using the sword against each other. Eventually, far more Christians, a hundred times more Christians, were slaughtered by the sword of the church than had ever been slain by the Romans. Very disturbing that this ended up happening and that this is part of our history. We're going to look more at the Constantinian shift and uh, some of this in future sessions. But I want to come back to Constantine. Now, Constantine knew he couldn't lead a Christian lifestyle. From the year 313, he tolerates Christianity. And then about 10 years later, right before the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, he uh, has this vision, allegedly, and he starts really favoring the Christians. So we have toleration followed by favoring, and then what we see is his involvement with the church over and over again to get the church into good shape in his eyes, to get everyone agreed on doctrine, on practice, 
to deal with any schisms, and to really put Christianity forward as a viable option for people in the Roman Empire. But he himself does not become a full Christian until he's about to die. Just before he dies, he asks Eusebius of Nicomedia to baptize him. He takes off his purple robes, puts on the white robes of a catechumen, and is baptized and and dies. Constantine was a bloody man, not just in traditional warfare. He also had his son Crispus executed. He had his wife Faustus executed. There's lots of skeletons in his closet. He knew he couldn't follow Christ and be the Roman emperor at the same time. And so he waited until he was about to die. And then he had this huge church built called the Church of the Holy Apostles in Constantinople. By the way, he started a new capital called Constantinople. The capital of the Roman Empire had always been what? Rome, of course. Rome is the capital of the Roman Empire. Constantine starts a new capital in a place called Byzantium and names it after himself. He literally marks out the boundaries of the city and says, this will be my capital. And he builds Constantinople into this glorious metropolis, this major city. He builds church. It's the first city that's like built on Christianity. So you, churches are built in from the, from the start. One of these churches is the Church of the Holy Apostles. In it, he has 12 cenotaphs, which are empty tombs. So there's a tomb for each of the 12 apostles. And then there's a 13th, and that's where Constantine had himself buried. Just to give you a sense of how he thought about himself. We had mass conversions after this. People start joining Christianity in droves. Before this, to be a Christian, you were taking a risk. You could get executed for becoming a Christian. You could lose family members that would no longer talk to you. You would suffer to become a Christian. Not always, but but the risk is always there. After this, to be a Christian is to have the emperor's favor, (laughs) okay? And to be one of the cool kids, if I could put it like that. Joseph Lynch says it more eloquently in his early Christianity book. He writes, Over time, entire villages, cities, tribes, kingdoms, and the Roman Empire itself accepted the new religion. A growing body of imperial laws made life hard for pagans and heretics, stripping them of legal protections and threatening serious punishments. For instance, their places of worship were closed down. The sacrifices of animals that were at the heart of pagan worship were banned. Bishops and monks now and then conducted campaigns to destroy pagan temples and statues of the gods. And we get a lot of iconoclasm where Christian gangs, essentially, especially this happens in Alexandria, but Christian gangs of monks start going around and just breaking stuff and tearing things down. And and the governmental officials don't stop them because they're in favor of taking down the old uh, idols and, and temples. We also got the institutionalization of charity. Before this, charity was done person to person. If you have some money and you see somebody in your community of faith that is in need, you could give it directly. You could give it to the church and the church could handle it locally. After this, the government gets involved with charity because Constantine has these Christian advisors and they're telling them, well, what do you do about all these poor people? What should we do? So you have institutionalization of charity and you also get something else I'm going to talk about later, which is the monastic movement of monks and nuns where they have these convents and monasteries and they institutionalize charity as well, especially for orphans, but lots of other kinds of charity too. And then another Major difference uh, with the Constantinian shift, and John Howard Yoder points this out, is the, they lose the separation from the world. So if you read the Gospel of John or 1 John, especially those two books in the Bible, uh, Jesus is very clear, like, you know, friendship with me is enmity with the world. And, you know, if you're going to be with me, you know, they hated me, they're going to hate you. You know, there's this antagonism towards the world in general, and this is something that shifts at this time. The church had been persecuted by the world. Think about it with plenty of the younger. 
Plenty of the younger, this is going back a little bit, but plenty of the younger had people drop off anonymous information, anonymous tips that so-and-so is a Christian. That was happening. And then sometimes there would be mobs of people, like with Polycarp of Smyrna, a mob gathered and they demanded his blood. Or sometimes it was government persecution, like in the Diocletian persecution. The Roman government moved from persecution to tolerance, to active support. John Howard Yoder puts it this way in his book, The Original Revolution. He says, The central nature of this change, which Constantine himself did not invent nor force upon the church, is not a matter of doctrine nor of polity. Polity is how churches govern themselves. It is the identification of church and world and the mutual approval and support exchanged by Constantine and the bishops. This is big. The identification of church and world. He goes on, The church is no longer the obedient, suffering line of the true prophets. She has a vested interest in the present order of things and uses the cultic means at her disposal to legitimate that order. The Constantinian shift, just summarizing here before our our review, the Constantinian shift initiated a new stage in church history. And this is what we often call Christendom. It's a merger. The idea that a society or nation could be Christian, not individuals, not groups of people, but a whole society or nation. Before long, all infants would be baptized, making everyone a member of the church by birth. This would take centuries, okay? But this is the process that begins with Constantine. Everyone would be raised Christian. The government would pay clergy their salaries. How many of these so-called Christians followed Christ? Evangelism was no longer needed. The kingdom had come. The Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire and seen as God's kingdom on earth. Just to be clear, I'm not blaming Constantine for everything. But we see with him, with the benefit of hindsight, a process that he begins that ends with this idea of Christendom. Let's review. Constantine's involvement in Christianity brought several significant changes, both good and bad, initiating the merger of the church and the state known as Christendom. Constantine ended the persecution of Christians, issuing the Edict of Milan along with Licinius in 313. Constantine donated large sums of money to rebuild churches, build new churches, and support clergy. Constantine's favoritism of Christianity incentivized people to join the church. Christians changed from discouraging military participation to blessing it. Christians pursued the emperor's favor to persecute pagans, Jews, and other Christian sects with different beliefs. Constantine's desire to have Christian advisors in his entourage caused some Christians to begin identifying the Roman Empire as God's kingdom on earth. The guiltiest one among them was Eusebius. I told you he was a fanboy of Constantine. The guy wrote a biography of Constantine called The Life of Constantine. And it's very clear that Eusebius was very impressed with Constantine and thought that God had specifically called him to do what he did. I'll come back to this whole stuff about the kingdom of God later, but he didn't like the idea of a future kingdom of God. He much preferred a spiritualized understanding of what the kingdom of God was as the church and now, as time goes on, hopefully as the empire as well, doing God's bidding as his kingdom on earth. Rather than strict obedience to the teachings of Christ, Christendom came to lower the requirements for all while the zealous left pursuing monasticism, whether as isolated hermits or in communities. So I'm going to come back to talk about the monastic movement. We're going to have a whole session on it. It's it's really significant for you to know about. But once everyone's a Christian, I don't know if you remember, we, we had gone through in the early church orders the process of conversion. Three years, and you're trained, and there's all this elaborate instruction and then they're going to cast the demons out of you two, three times. And then they're, you're going to have you fast for days. And then wake you up early in the morning on Sunday. And they're going to 
they're going to bring you to the bishop. And there's all this rigmarole with the baptism. And then finally coming in, you get the kiss of peace and you take your first communion, right? There's this whole elaborate process in the third century for baptism and becoming a Christian. And now everyone wants to be a Christian all in a short period of time. How are you going to logistically ensure that they're real Christians and not just coming because of other reasons? It's a logistical problem. I, I don't want to fault the church for watering it down, but that's what ended up happening, is that we watered it down, so now it's just believe these few things, and you're saved. And it wasn't also follow Jesus. However, many Christians, they really wanted to follow Jesus. They, wanted it to, they were zealous. They wanted to go all in. And so they would sell all their possessions and go live out by themselves in the desert. And they were called hermits. And this was considered a very prestigious calling in the church at that time. And then others gathered together, and they were the monks or the nuns, and they said, we're going to really, we're going to be superstar Christians. We're going to actually do the things in the book. And so they ended up leaving the church at the same time as this Constantinian shift was happening. We have the monastic movement going out into the desert at the same time. So those are just some of the changes that were brought about by Constantine. Rather than strict obedience to the teachings of Christ, Christendom came to lower the requirements. Real bummer. But we will look at this more next time. And we'll get into the, the whole question of how did Constantine affect doctrine? Because as some of you probably know, Constantine was involved at the Council of Nicaea. In fact, he called it. He not only called the Council of Nicaea, he suggested the theo most theologically important and problematic word of the whole creed of Nicaea. That's all Constantine. So we'll cover that next time as we continue in our quest through early church history. Well, that brings this session to an end. What do you think? Come on over to restitudio.org and leave your feedback there under episode 493 on the Constantinian shift. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this. Do you think it was good? Do you think it was bad? Do you think it was more good than bad, more bad than good? I lean towards the more bad than good side, as I think I made plain in this episode, although I did try to be fair-minded and not use Constantine as a whipping boy of sorts. Anyhow, I'd love to see what you think. Next time, we're going to delve into the Trinitarian controversy of the 4th century, starting with Arius and Alexander of Alexandria. So that's going to be a blast, let me tell you looking at the history of what happened and really considering the primary sources, not just what evangelical textbooks want you to believe, but what actually happened. So stay tuned for that. Also, I wanted to let you know about an event that is coming up this summer, June 24th to July 1st, and that is our annual family camp. This is an event that I am coordinating in upstate New York. It's right on Lake George, which is a beautiful, beautiful lake nestled in the Adirondack Mountains at a YMCA camp there called Silver Bay. And the buildings are beautiful and old, and we have morning and evening Bible teachings which, with lots of free time in the afternoons. If you're interested in coming, let me tell you, it would be great to meet you. It would be great to see you there. And we're always looking for first-timers to come and try it out. It's an event that is great for you if you're a single person, actually ideal for you if you're a single person, because then you can really do what you want and attend what you want as far as like optional afternoon stuff and go hiking whenever you want. Uh, but it also is an event for those of you with families and children in particular, because we do have a full children's program for ages 5 through 12 that my wife Ruth coordinates, and uh, she's got a great team that works with her to do that. And then, the, of course, the YMCA f facility offers uh, children's programming for those that are four and younger, right down to infants, really. So if you'd like to come, whatever age you are, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you are uh, coming with a, a huge family or just a couple, uh, there's a bunch of different housing options that you can pick. And I put a link in the show notes for this episode 
which is also available at lhim.org. That stands for Living Hope International Ministries, lhim.org, and we should have the family camp registration link right on the homepage, so it'll be easy for you to find. And it would be great to see you there. Our theme is going to be God's people. We'll be looking at 1 Peter 2.9, which talks about how, as Christians, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that we may proclaim his excellencies for calling us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Um, so if, if this appeals to you, we'd love to see you there. So if you're up for an adventure, you want to visit New York in the summer, it's a great place to go in the summer. It's not insanely hot, but we do have a good strong sun for summer activities. There's boating, there's hiking, there's indoor and outdoor basketball courts. There's a little beach for the kiddos. There's swim lanes for those of you who are into swimming. There's sailboats. There's uh, clay tennis courts. I mean, it's got everything. So I hope to see some of you there. If you do have questions about the events and uh, figuring out travel and whatnot, you can go ahead and shoot me an email, sean at restitudio.org, and I'll see what I can do to help you get there. Well, that's it for today. Next week, like I mentioned, we're going to be jumping back into the subject of Christology and theology and seeing what in the world happened in the 4th century, what really happened in the 4th century. And that's going to be a great ride. So I encourage you to come back next week. That's it for me. If you'd like to support Restitutio, you can do that on our website, restitutio.org. I'll catch you next week. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.